we're human too, and I think there can be a fear of silence, a very human fear, but uh, when you get to live it and experience and choose it more and more deeply, there's such a, a peace in it. My name is Sister Kushla. I've been here for almost 24 years. I um, originally was, I was born in Tapanui, which is down in West Otago, but um, my family moved to Christchurch when I was two and a half. And so I um, grew up in St. Paul's Parish here and went to school and then to university and worked for five years as a demographic analyst at Statistics New Zealand and then um, all that all those years though I was kind of running away from what I thought was God calling me and so eventually I um, I stopped running and I thought I'd better give it a go or it's not going to go away this nagging so um, that was yeah, nearly a quarter of a century ago and so I've been here ever since. I'm Sister Catherine of Christ I have been in the Carmelite Monastery for eight and a half years I made my final vows three years ago 2019 and um, before coming to Carmel, I had spent eight years in the States doing kind of mission work and discerning a call to belong to God. Um, but it became clearer that it was meant to be Carmel further down the track. So that's how I kind of came in this direction, but back home to New Zealand. Um, yeah. And um, you both mentioned, yeah, you felt drawn to Carmel. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came down to it, what... Yeah, what attracted you here as opposed to other orders? Um, I think God calls to a specific order and um, there was in me an attraction and a kind of a repulsion because I did a, a school project when I was 17, 16, 17 on the Carmelites and there was always over those years there was something that attracted me, this being with God, I think. And then also I, there's something because I wanted to marry and have a family and I thought I would, could never be happy without that. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's that attraction to what God wants and, and you kind of, I think you realize that ultimately he wants your, your happiness and that this, where he's calling you, um, you will find that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me it was um, kind of out of the blue actually, coming to Carmel. Um, because I had been discerning a call to be of belonging to God and I tried with a different order and I hadn't made my final commitment with them. Um, but yes, it kind of came out of left field that a priest, when I was talking to him kind of about my struggles and what I was going through at that time, he said, did you ever discern a, a call to contemplative life? And I said, well, no, but no, I would like, it just, it was so out of the blue, um, but that planted the seed and more and more things of my own desires. Um, it was definitely God calling, but it also, I, I began to see that it aligned more with who I was and how God had kind of made me and the journey that I've been on had been preparing me for contemplative life and that that was a better fit. Although of course it was a step of faith because you can't say it, it's definitely what you're supposed to be doing before you've even been there. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I was young, I read St. Teresa of Azure, I loved her. Um, so there's always that, that love for Carmel, but not any real great knowledge of the Carmelite um, life. And yeah, the Lord sort of had it that he prepared me in many ways for here without me knowing what he was doing <laughs> until the time came. Um, what is a day in the life in Carmel like? We get up at 5.30 and then throughout the day we keep coming back to our part of the chapel, which is called the choir, for um, to recite the divine office. Then, so we have we begin at six, and then we have an hour of silent prayer, which is really about intimate conversation with God. And then we have our breakfast, do some work, maybe there's cattle to feed sometimes, there's older breads to prepare, um, older sisters to look after, and then we come together for another hour of. Um, another time of the Divine Office and then Mass. Then after that we go to our, pre our, our work and then we come together for another time of the Divine Office, then have our midday meal, then our first time of recreation, which doesn't mean we like play football or anything. We um, come together and we talk because most of our days are spent in silence. And so then after that we have some quiet time, 
to do work, then some spiritual reading time, and then um, again the divine office, then work, then the divine office, then another hour of silent prayer, then uh, evening meal and recreation, then <clears throat> more of the divine office, and then back to our rooms for the for the night. So it's it's kind of it's very balanced because you have times of prayer, most time of silence, time together, um, manual work, and also study. And so it's, um, it's, it's got a good um, balance, I think, and a good rhythm. Mm -hmm. This is very different to the world out here. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, and you live, um, not completely apart from it, but you, know, you live an enclosed life. Um, was there anything you struggled with um, when you first entered? I mean, probably still now, but, you know. <laughs> A couple of weeks after I'd entered, I, it really hit me that I was only going to see my mother for one hour a month for the rest of her life, and it really. And then I realised that my nieces and nephews were going to grow out, grow up without me being present with them, and so I got, had, I think, had a bit of day of homesickness <laughs> at that stage, and so. But then after that, that, that was gone. But I suppose the struggles is you have to. Um, living with others you actually come to see yourself and all your wounds all your um, anything that's gone on in your your background actually comes to the surface with the silence and the solitude and the relationships and community so um, actually having to struggle through to realize that um, the any problems they're actually about you and not about the person out there who may be um, triggering them so um, I think that's been a struggle over over the years, but it actually, you, as you grow, you realise that um, you know, every lifestyle is going to have its um, moments where, and we kind of live it quite intensely. So I remember a, a Maris brother saying that what you go through in Carmel in your early years is similar to what your, your brothers and sisters who are living in the world will go through at midlife, sort of, because um, you're you're brought kind of into a glass house and um, the heat is on and you have to deal with all your wounds and give them to the Lord and trust that he's actually going to fix them. If he wants them fixed or some of them he might leave with you to your last breath, but everything so that you completely trust in him. Yes, since we're sent, Teresa Lazio, in her writing, she talks about all these little, like, annoying things. <laughs> you know, they probably become even more um, obvious when you're living, like, a contemplative, silent life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because yes. I, like, when I remember, like, if I had a bad day at work or something, or someone was getting on my nerves, you know, I could go, you go out to dinner and go out to the movies or something, or do something. Well, you actually can't do that here. You, you <laughs> might end up sitting next to somebody who drives you... <laughs> <laughs> we <bit> silly. <laughs> yes. And with time, and especially with the silence, you see things in a different light, and you see your own part in what you're struggling with, with others, if it's something to do with another person. So it's very purifying. Um, or at least it feels purifying, at least hope it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a favourite Carmelite saint? No matter what you mentioned, John. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mentioned earlier, um, I'm a convert. And a big part of my pre-conversion time was reading the lives of the saints. It just, I, that's all I read. And one of my favourites was Saint Therese of Lisieux. And um, I think I did read her book, her autobiography there, but I read more books about her. And um, I think I've sort of grown over the years in my understanding of her, her spirituality and her message from what people have written about her to what she herself wrote. You know, going deeper into um, just just um, sitting with it and praying with it and growing with it, especially now that I'm a Carmelite myself. Um, going back to her writings, I mean, sometimes, it, you know, for a while there I was reading her, her autobiography every year and each year getting something else out of it. So, but now I love all the Carmelite saints pretty much, you know. <laughs> if I listed them, it would be most of them. Um, I love, yeah, the Carmelite spirituality. Um, my favourite one is um, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein, and I think she had a, a big role in my coming to Carmel because, as I mentioned, that I came to visit and do an interview with the sisters when I was 16 or 17, and they gave me these pamphlets, 
and I took them home and she was sitting, she was on the front of one of these pamphlets looking at me for several years after that and I kind of, it was as if she was looking at me and saying, what are you doing? Where are you? And so um, and she said, I, I love her writings. I, a lot of them go over my head. <laughs> she was a philosopher. Um, but yeah, just, she had the same experiences that I had. You know, she went to university, she sat exams, she did a lot better than I did. <laughs> um, she had to go to job interviews and things and so I just, I really felt a, um, akin to her. And so I, and I'm sure she's, you know, um, when I have any struggles or something, I kind of do a dialogue, uh, writing down a dialogue between her and me. And it, she, it always the clarity comes because she's so, um, yeah. And I think sometimes saints have a, have a role in your, actual, your own life and, and, and your struggles. So um, I think she's definitely had that for me and, and it's ongoing. And what is something that um, you really enjoy about? <laughs> Lots of things. No, you wouldn't still be there. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've noticed much more so because I was elected prioress two months ago, was it? And um, just more so, the, there's there's so much <laughs> being um, coming at you from every every angle, and just those two hours of silent prayer to just kneel down or sit down and just be with the Lord for those times, and it. I think when there's so many other things going on, it, it makes it heightens that um, that experience, and I just ah, oh, that's wonderful. And if I had to miss them, like I had to go to the um, emergency department recently, and you know, miss that, that hour of silent prayer, and um, you you miss it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the time of silent prayer. Um, yeah, just the, and the silence in general of our life, and. I mean, we're human and we can fall, we can kind of go off track and fill that silence with other things. And but when you're drawn back to it, um, and that tends to be, you know, with more purification and going deeper, it's just, it's a richness that's so free. It's free. It's free. And, um, you know, I often feel compassion for, you know, with so many people today that are addicted to their screens and almost, there's an almost enslavement there. Um, and you know we're human too and i think there can be a fear of silence a very human fear but uh, when you get to live it and experience and choose it more and more deeply there's such a a peace in it and um an encounter with god that it's very yeah you can't you can't buy it it is it is free but there's got to be that choice to of being empty basically not filling that space or that time with something but just it's just silent. I thought you said you're human too. Yes. <laughs> um, I think one time I was running a retreat for and a young person, I told them about the Carmelites and they were like, are they robots? <laughs> um, I just couldn't understand how people could choose to live um, this kind of life. And so my final question for you is, um, why would you choose to live this way? I guess like what, um, if you had to kind of explain it, mm. why? <laughs> I think you'd only do it as a response to a call, um, but then, um, yeah, then it just it becomes so joyful. I think you get because all those other things that uh, society tells us are so important, when they're kind of stripped away, you realise that um, you don't actually miss them because you're actually living quite a real, sometimes a raw life and quite a real life because the relationships are very real. Um, you don't kind of, you can't wear masks, or I mean, you have to sometimes with COVID, but you, 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 take, you take your masks, masks off and, and be very real with others, so. Yeah. But I think having having little, um, it just makes you, you appreciate more what you've got. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, even, you know, St. Teresa in the 1500s answered that question in her writing. It was a book of the foundations where she writes about how really only the nuns who are called here can understand what it means mm -hmm. to be behind Carmel's walls. And no one else can fully understand that. I mean, when I got here, I just, that's why I didn't really struggle for a long time. I just, I loved it. It was like, yeah, heaven on earth. It just, I couldn't wait to get here and, um, yeah, so it's interesting, you know, St. Teresa wouldn't have used the word robot because I don't think they had any understanding of it in the 1500s. <laughs> but she answered that same question for people, that mm -hmm. really, unless you're called, it doesn't, 
nobody could fully understand unless they're called. The joy of living enclosed and away. But it's not a running away. It's just, you know, as St. Therese said, being hidden in the heart of the church. Um, and knowing also the efficacy of our prayer. Not knowing it maybe directly, but just believing in that in faith. Um, yeah. Thank you, sisters. Thank Thanks. you.